Milt, it's Bob Lazari and Tony D'Angelo on MNST here in uh, Eastern Connecticut. Welcome to the show, Milt. Good evening, Milt. Hey, Bob and Tony. How are you guys doing? Well, it's, it's a pleasure to, to have, have you. you on, and uh, we've wanted to do it for a while, and uh, we try to work around the uh, Ultimate Air Dogs, which we'll get to a little we later. We will talk but, about uh, that. It's truly an honor to have you on. Uh, Milt, we were just talking. Uh, we gave a little bit of your background before you came on. Again, for our uh, viewers who just tuned in, uh, Milt enjoyed uh, a 16-year career, Tony, uh, between 1970 and 1986, uh, drafted by Cincinnati in the second round of the 68 draft, made his uh, MLB debut in September of 1970 with the Reds, uh, again, uh, had his heyday years in Detroit. We're going to try to do this chronologically, Milt, to make it easier as far as uh, both on all of our memories here and to keep a little <laughs> bit of a flow. Especially the, the guys uh, doing the show, Milt. Well, ho hopefully I can rem remember back that far, so we'll try. <laughs> I think you'll be fine, but we talked a little bit. Tony and I just mentioned you, you came up in 1970. Here you were, 20 years old. Uh, you go 3-1 and one with a 2.4 ERA. You find yourself a member of a World Series team. Uh, you must have thought it was going to be easy, Mel, at the beginning there. Well, you know what? When you, when you had the kind of arm I had back in those days, it was pretty easy. I was, uh, I was, I was lucky enough to be... To have a you know a 95 mile an hour fastball and a good breaking ball and a pretty good changeup uh, back in those days and uh, you know it, it, everything came pretty easy for me you know, I think when you when you got that kind of ability and you have good control um, as you can see some of the young pitchers nowadays that are doing that uh, you could you can step right in there and do it and of course I came up with a team that was uh, a great team I think and. Uh, I, I kind of stepped in there and, and filled a couple of gaps there late in the season in 70. And, uh, you know, I was lucky enough to be made eligible for the uh, playoffs in the World Series that year. Yeah, and uh, again, I'll, I'll mention to our fans out there, Milt, uh, 119 wins during his career. Uh, ERA just over four, Tony. Uh, these days, that gets you $10 million a year. But, yeah, uh, it does. <laughs> But, uh, Milt, you were... Uh, but Milt's got complete games. <laughs> <laughs> we mentioned you had 73 complete games, 10 shutouts over your career. Uh, very impressive, Tony, was the seven consecutive double-digit win seasons yeah. all in Detroit. And uh, But I, I have to ask you, uh, Milt, you came up and you, you had Sparky Anderson as your manager. You uh, would be reunited with him uh, when you get to Detroit uh, in the 70s. But uh, as far as when you came up... Uh, in uh, 1970 with Sparky, uh, what kind of man was he? Was there a difference in the Sparky of the, uh, let's put it, the early 70s and uh, of the early 80s? Yeah, uh, there definitely was. I, and I think what happened is that Sparky, of course, when he came up with the Cincinnati Reds or came over to the Cincinnati Reds, you know, he replaced a manager by the name of Dave Bristol, who had led that team to really close finishes the last couple of years. And I think Bob Housem, uh, who was the general manager and, and uh, vice president or president of the Cincinnati Reds, wanted they, he wanted somebody in there that could get a light a fire under the guys uh, in a different way than Dave than uh, than, than uh, the manager uh, Dave Bristol had done before. I think uh, you know sometimes when you have a hard nosed manager, you need somebody to come in with a little softer touch. And uh, at that time, Sparky had a little bit softer touch than Dave Bristol. And of course, he came in there at just the right time. Uh, Cincinnati exploded. Uh, that was a year that. Uh, Wayne Simpson, of course, started off. I think he started off 13 and one, and he was going to be the next Bob Gibson. I, guess, I think at about that time of his yeah. career before he hurt his shoulder. That's right. And you know, Don Gullett was there, and myself, and they just, you know, the the Cincinnati Reds looked like they were on the verge of really putting together a, uh, a powerhouse team for years to come. But um, you know, uh, but he came in at the right time, and of course, we went into the playoffs that year, and uh, we swept the. Uh, Pittsburgh Pirates. They had Willie Starger, Roberto Clemente, uh, Manny Sangui, and they. I mean, they had a great team then. And then, of course, we went into the World Series against the Baltimore Orioles. And of course, you know, we we only had to go up against Brooks Robinson, Frank Robinson. Uh, you know, the four four twenty game winners they had that year, and Brooke Powell and all those guys. I mean, they they had a tremendous team, and uh, it just came down to pitching, and they had a little bit better pitching and defense than the Cincinnati Reds did that year. And I remember mm -hmm. Tony, and Tony and I talk about this a lot, Milt, uh, 1970, I think I was in the fourth grade, Tony, and, and coming home from school and watching these games on TV. Well, that was is, such a nice feeling. It was, it was yeah. amazing, right, when you, you rushed home from school. But, uh, and you mentioned uh, guys like Gullett and uh, yourself and Nolan. There had to be something in that Cincinnati system, Milt, uh, because all you guys basically came up as late teenagers 
and could throw the heck out of the ball. Uh, was there some good pitching coaches in the minor leagues? Uh, because you, you really, uh, the, the team gave birth to some great young arms there uh, around the, uh, the turn of the decade back then. Well, I, I think what happened is that Cincinnati knew they had a bunch of good hitters coming up in, in the in the system. You know, they had Johnny Bench and Pete Rose and uh, Bobby Tolan. I mean, they had some really great uh, hitters, and they were looking for young pitchers. And I, I think the scouts that they had at that time uh, really worked the – yeah, you know, back in those days, they didn't have really a scouting bureau, and they just had scouts that went out into the high schools and 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 JCs and colleges and looked for these guys. And they had a really uh, great scouting department with the Cincinnati Reds back in those days, and and they're still bringing up young, good young players. But mm. um, they've that's just how they kind of built their organization was through their scouting. Uh, the same guy that signed me uh, in 1968 signed Johnny Bench in 19, I believe, 65. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, they they had a lot of faith in that guy and and uh, you know it was just one of those things they they had a bunch of good young arms come up through there and and uh, you know some of them didn't develop as well as others uh, they traded me away after the seventy one season mm -hmm. um, not sure why but uh, then I went over to Cleveland and started my career over there and then started off really well and then I I hurt my shoulder uh, you know I, I was leading the American League almost in every category that year in seventy two made the front page of the sporting news and everything else and then all of a sudden I woke up one morning I couldn't I even brush that. my teeth so wow. you know you just never know what's going to happen you don't and I'm looking at that 72 season mill 27 starts ERA of 3.4 and you go 7 and 14 and mm -hmm. uh, you know again these days telling you the, the different eras and everything it's yeah insane. but you know the funny thing about that year which it doesn't really start the show I started out that season 6 and 1 and I had a point eighty earn run average Boy, I remember <laughs> So I mean there was I mean I had had I think two or three uh, complete game or shutouts and I was just I mean I had everything going and then I had pitched a game I remember against uh, uh, Dave McNally pitched against Dave McNally he was with the Baltimore Orioles at the mm -hmm. time and I just pitched like three games in a row and everything was just working really well and I I think I got beat two to one that game. And it was a great game, and I, you know, everything was good. I didn't really hurt myself or anything. And I woke up the next morning, and I went in. The, you know, I was going to, you know, you give you a big yawn, hands over the head of the thing, and then brush my teeth. And I couldn't even brush my teeth. My shoulder was so sore. Wow. And from then on, it was just it was a struggle the rest of that year. I think I went, um, I think I went one and thirteen the rest of the year. My earn run average, of course, was still pretty good. But I started out my first seven innings, I was like point eighty. Right. So. Mm -hmm. It was. It was. It's almost like the the kid from the Colorado Rockies is doing this year. Oh yeah, now, that yeah. guy has a phenomenal start to the season. Could be one of the greatest pitching seasons ever. I mean, they're comparing him with Bob Gibson's season. So mine was on that track at that time. But it was just one of those things. I hurt my shoulder, and you know, basically, it took me about six years for my shoulder to come back around where I could actually pitch again. Wow. You're watching Monday Night Sports Talk, uh, the July 5th edition. On the phone with us, former Major League pitcher Milt Wilcox. Tony, question for Milt. And Milt, a pleasure. We're honored. Good evening. Uh, the, um, this is the question that I always wondered about Sparky. On one side, you've got the guys like Gullet who are throwing BBs, and yet he seemed to kind of make his bread and butter, if you were, and guys like you, know, you in the later years, Tanana, Billingham, um, you know, merit, you know, maybe down towards the end. Did Sparky like hard throwers? Did he like guys like you that were around the plate? Or did he really, uh, it was like, you know, win a game and I'm happy? Actually, Sparky kind of changed. He he really, you know, he was basically the guy that brought in the platooning of, of uh, you know, the, the changing the pitchers. You know, back in those days, he was named as, he, they called him Captain Hook because yeah. he had guys in the bullpen that could, you know, he had the Raleigh Eastwicks and the Wayne Grangers and Pedro Borbone, and those guys could come out and pitch 90, they could get into 90 games. And you were seeing those guys, anytime there was a chance for a, you know, tight game, those guys were coming in the game. And he was, he was the guy that basically started, you know, the, 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 the different pitchers coming in at the different times. He was a little bit ahead of his time in that respect. And then he really got into the platooning big time. I mean, he platooned the right-handed hitters against the left-handed pitchers and different things like that. So Sparky was kind of kind of uh, ahead of his time. Uh, he, I don't think 
to all the pitchers used to get get together and say, I don't think he likes pitchers. <laughs> you know, because he'd never leave you in for a complete game. I mean, he was always jerking you out. And, yeah. and the funny thing about Sparky, when he came over in 70, 79 with the Tigers, I'd already been there for two years. And 78, I'd had a really good year. I had, you know, 15 or 16. I, I don't know how many complete games I had. And the first thing he did is when he came over, he took me out of the starting rotation because he said I wasn't a, uh, he wasn't looking for a six inning pitcher. He was looking for a a nine inning pitcher. And I, I said, Sparky, did you see the stats from last year? But <laughs> you know, Sparky was his own guy. I mean, I, I I think he had a lot of ideas. He changed the way he was from Cincinnati to to the Detroit Tigers. You know, when he got to Cincinnati, he picked his own team. I mean, when he was in Cincinnati, the team was already there. Yeah. When he came to the Detroit Tigers, he got to mold his own team. That's for sure. And, and those 70, 71 teams of which Milt was a member, Tony, Bench, Rose, Concepcion, Foster, Perez, Nolan, Gull, we can go on and on. Yeah. This was the beginning of the big red machine. Big I remember going out there in 76. I had got my uh, driver's license and, and driving out there to Riverfront, and this was you know, the 76 team, uh, mm -hmm. I saw them, you know, just annihilate Montreal that year out there uh, in, in a series. But I got to ask you about uh, Bench because obviously you threw to him, Milt, uh, back in 70, 71. Uh, you knew he was going to be good. Uh, did you know he would be a Hall of Fame material? And what was it like? Because Tony and I talk about him all the time, the way he would throw we guys do. out on his knees, how he handled pitches. It looked so easy to him. Well, when you have when you have hands bigger than basketballs, you know he could he had gigantic hands and and uh, he could he not only handle a bat well, of course you know his stats as a as a as a home run hitter, but he could throw the ball. I mean, this guy when you threw a, when you threw a pitch and a guy was stealing, you better get down on the ground because he's throwing a. I remember a, that in a, his book very well. Yeah, he, he's, he's throwing letters, a pee right? up the he's throwing a pee up the middle. Uh, you know, about chest high, and, he, and he, if you're in the way, he's going to knock you down. So uh, you had to you had to respect his arm. I think all of the um, the teams did. And not a lot of not, not a lot of stolen bases against Johnny Bench. Uh, he was a great catcher, great hitter, and uh, he really was the fire plug, I, I believe, to those uh, Cincinnati Red teams. He sure was. Uh, mm -hmm. We talk about all, just a, what a pleasure to watch, Tony. Jeez, Never mind yeah. his offense, but we used to just watch and be marvel at his defense. But as we talk to Milt, we have a collage of pictures we're going to put on the screen, Tony, some of his old baseball cards. Uh, uh, and uh, we'll look at some of those from uh, some from a variety of the teams he played for. But uh, I'm looking at those uh, the, the Cleveland years now, Mill. Again, uh, you struggled again. You said with the arm problems in uh, '73, uh, you had 19 starts. You, you did make, uh, of course, uh, you're eight and ten that year. But it must have been uh, still tough on you. Uh, and looking at some of those. Uh, teammates in Cleveland, Tony, the Perry brothers. Uh, but That's what was right. it like pitching with Gaylord Perry? I have to ask you. Well, I, I have to, I, I have to admit, I, I really, uh, I was, I, re I really loved pitching with Gaylord Perry. He was probably one of the most, I mean, I pitched with Gaylord Perry for three years over there and I pitched mm -hmm. with Jack Morris for quite a few years with the, with the Tigers. Mm -hmm. And everybody was always saying what kind of competitor Jack Morris was, but probably Gaylord Perry was the, probably the most competitive player, I'm going to say wow. pitcher or player, that I ever played with. I mean, he wanted to win at all costs. And, of course, you know, it was always uh, suggested that he doctored the baseball and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But, you know, I think what happens is that um, as a baseball player, and, and, you know, you've always heard of the, you know, the people with the filing the ball or cutting the ball mm -hmm. or doing all this or, or plugging the bats or, you know, putting uh, cork in them. Everybody does what they have to do to try to get that little bit of an advantage, and I think that's what everybody did. But as a competitor, um, I mean, I played with some great ball players, and I pitched against some, sure you know, did. top of the line Hall of Famers. But I think Gaylord Perry probably was the most competitive person that I've ever seen. That's that's, uh, that's an, an amazing thing. And, uh, his uh, brother Jim totally had a, had, a, had a pretty decent career himself. He, he but did. Uh, back in those Cleveland days, you remember, I'm looking at some of the people on that roster. It, it's funny that Milt played with uh, Ray Fossey, Tony, and Pete Rose, and they had that. Uh, <laughs> uh, their, their paths cr cr yes. crossed literally at one point during their careers. But, uh, yeah, that, 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 that occurred to me. But uh, in Cleveland, uh, Milt, that stadium back then, it, it seemed so big and so uh, the old mun municipal, correct, Tony? Yes. That was, it was yes. so big, and I just think of the steel beams and everything. What was it like pitching in Cleveland? 
That was terrible. We never had any people. The only time we had people there was when Gaylord Perry pitched. You know, whenever <laughs> wow. anybody else was there, nobody was ever at the game. It's a you know? big place. Too. Um, yeah, I, you know, one of the things that I really have to, uh, that I I look back on my career is some of the guys that I actually played with and had coach. You know, my first year there in Cleveland, I had Warren Spahn as my pitching coach and, and Rocky Calavito as my hitting coach. And I, that was that was pretty special to talk to both of those guys and get some information, you know, try to, Get some inf- that's, information that's from incredible. those guys, and of course, my last year in Cleveland, uh, that was when uh, toward the end of the year was '74. Uh, that's when Frank Robinson came over uh, there, and then the next year in '75, he was the player manager for the for the Tigers. So I, I, I kind of, you know, I was lucky enough to not only play with and against those guys, but also uh, be able to pick some of their brains and see, you know, what what was going on and and and, uh, and what I call the superstars. You know, I I look at you know. I was a pretty good pitcher, but these guys were a step ahead of me. Uh, they were just a step ahead of me, probably because they had the longevity and they had the, you know, playing most of their career without injuries. But, uh, you know, they, they do things a little bit different. Their work ethics a little bit different than most other people. And it was, it was a, an exciting time for me to learn that stuff. You're watching MNST, July 5th edition. On the phone with us, former pitcher Milt Wilcox. And uh, also on that team, Tony, during that time, you had Greg Nettles. You remember Nettles he, when Cleveland yeah, at the time team, and Chambliss. A lot of, a lot of Yankee uh, Cleveland uh, action back then, including Peterson and Kekic, who yeah. uh, <laughs> had, had another. Uh, we won't get into that, but uh, they had a little uh, history of themselves. Charlie Spikes, remember Charlie I Spikes? Remember Charlie Leslie Spikes. Charlie Spikes yes. had some good years, but uh, you, you I, have to remember back in those days, though. That I, I think one of the the things that really kind of this was before the commissioner really stepped in and did things to baseball. Sure. I mean, yeah, you know, Judge Landis and all that other stuff. But, you know, in 1972 or 73, the, the, the Cleveland Indians and the Yankees made a blockbuster trade. They traded Chris Chambliss, Greg Nettles, and Dick Tidro to the Yankees yeah. for five sore arm pitchers. That was big back yes. then, uh, and that was a huge trade for the Yankees, and it was a it was a devastating trade for the uh, Cleveland Indians that had, that had brought these guys up and was really grooming these guys uh, to to be to be you know, a, a yeah. big thing in their franchise. But what happened was, and a lot of people fail to realize this, the next year, the general manager that made that trade went over and became the general manager of the Yankees. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they've, they've, they've had, and Oscar Mitch Gamble Shander. was on a team, another one, Tony, yes. had New York and Cleveland roots, but question. And, uh, Milt, you get over to the Tigers uh, in the mid-'70s, in the late-'70s, and uh, you're confronted by Ralph Houck. What did you think about playing for Ralph? Well, I, I kind of liked Ralph Houck. He was a uh, definitely a, a baseball man, but he also liked to have fun. And, and it, it wasn't all baseball with Ralph Houck, and I think he was a great guy to have when when they had a guy like Mark Fidrich and Dave yeah. Rosema uh, just coming up. I think those guys, you know, two really good young pitchers. And, um, you know, and they also had some other – I mean, the, the Tigers back in those days, they had a young Steve Kemp and a young Jason Thompson. Yes. And they had, you know, a Ron LaFleur who was still a pretty mm-hmm. good player. And they had, you know, they had a, a variety. Tito Fuentes was on our team. Rusty yeah. Staub, Milt May. I mean, there was some really good ball players over there, and Ralph Houck was the guy that was basically put in charge of those guys to kind of let those guys play a little bit, let them have some fun, and don't make it too tough on them. But and then, of course, Ralph decided to retire, and 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 things changed, and of course, Sparky came in in '79. Yeah, the the major Tony. Remember, he used to pick up the pebbles during the innings all yeah, the time. We'd see him on the game of the week with the pebbles in his hands and uh, he kicked dirt in the umpire's pants. Yeah. But yeah, that uh, those uh, those old Tiger teams were fun to watch. I, I tell you, my next door neighbor Al was a huge Tiger fan, yes. and this was during the heyday. And of course, the Whitaker Trammell, one of the you'd have to say one of the better Up double the, play yeah. combinations we've seen over the years as far as Certain, longevity, yeah, everything else. Lifetime, yeah. And uh, you mentioned Jack Morris, uh, Milt. Uh, just when you think of Jack Morris, you think of a guy kind of like a Halliday type Tony, uh, uh, one of those uh, grinded out guys that would just like to finish what he started, yeah. did not want to come out of games, things like that. Throw you had an Aurelio Rodriguez, the, the lightning arm, you remember, yes. at the third baseman. Uh, Billingham, you had mentioned. Uh, I got to ask you about John Hiller too. Uh, a heart condition, uh, Mill, and I remember when that all took place. But he uh, actually became the team's closer and was a hell of a pitcher for a while with them. 
Yeah, John was, you know, he had, he had, uh, he was, he was overweight uh, early in his career, and that's when he had all of his heart problems. And then he had to go through a bypass. He survived the heart problems, and then came back. And he was, he was an outstanding pitcher for quite a long time in the major leagues. He was probably one of the premier relievers. I think at one time. He almost won 20 games as a reliever, I believe. I remember that well. Big, yeah, get, yeah he did. He was, uh, and that was the t time of the uh, the game of baseball, Milt, when relievers just didn't go one third, two thirds of an inning, uh, three and a third, three and two thirds, a la Goose Gossage and others you played yeah. with. Uh, that would be the norm. But uh, Tony, question. And uh, Milt, as far as 1984. Did you feel like when you guys were playing during the year something special's happening here, like in the city with the team? I mean, it just all seemed like, in retrospect, to kind of come together for you. Well, it, it was built. It was building. You know, if you go back and look at our at, at our teams from 1981 up, I mean, 1981 was the strike year. We had the best record in baseball. Uh, well, we had the best record in the American League that year, but we finished second the first half, and we finished second the second half. And we knew back then we had a good team. And then I believe in 82, 83, and 84, uh, if we didn't lead the league in pitching, we were real close. And 82 and 83, we were, I mean, we were right there. We just didn't have that one guy that came in and stopped, stopped the bullpen. I mean, that was a, stopped the teams in late innings. Just didn't have him. And then, uh, you know, as you know, that closer is so important in a game anymore and you got to have that guy that's going to come in and shut the yes. door almost every time and mm -hmm. then they made the trade with i believe it was chicago or phil it was philadelphia or chicago wherever willie came from willie, yeah. willie hernandez yep and whoever guillermo now i guess is one is what he wanted to be called mm -hmm. but he came over and and him was uh really a lopez and and him and the, the bullpen and of course the three three or four starters that we had that year was just it was a phenomenal year and yeah when we came out of spring training and we went 35 and five. Everybody's it kind of shocked us too, but we expected to win every game. And we went out there. We thought we had a chance to win every game we were in. And of course, with Trammell and Whitaker at the top of the lineup, and Gibson and Parrish, every time we went out the pitch, it seemed like we had three or four run lead. Tough guys, <laughs> and uh, yeah, nice to have a cushion. They yeah. ended up uh, Tigers again. Uh, Milt with a World Series ring. They, he was the winning pitcher game three of that World Series. Yes. Tony, uh, people forget that Trammell was the actual MVP of that uh, World Series. But uh, yeah, Willie Hernandez, Cy Young, and MVP in that year. That he, year. Can you imagine? I don't know if they would do that these days, the way they hand out awards. But he, I guess, he was so valuable to that he team. Was, but yeah. uh, and I had mentioned that to our indicative. viewers at the beginning, Milt, your postseason record again. Uh, all time three and one ERA of 1.42, only three earned runs and 19 innings pitched. Uh, very impressive. Uh, Tony, one more question for Milt. And Milt, you know, we did not want to leave the show without talking to you about your ultimate air dog endeavor. And yeah. How, how you got into it. <laughs> you got to tell us about this. No, that's my fun stuff. I, I really enjoy doing that. I, um, it's something that I, I was actually watching television one day, and this is about nine years ago. And um, I was watching television and the Prina Incredible Dog Challenge where the dogs saw do all sorts of things. They do, they fly through the air and they do frisbee and all this. And I was just having to be watching it and I saw these dogs running down a dock and jumping through the air, landing in the water. And I go, you know, I got a dog who can do that. And my dog's name is actually Sparky Anderson Wilcox. <laughs> and, and he's a black Sparky. lab and he's got white feet. And he was pretty much, I, I said, well, he's premature white like Sparky Anderson. So that's the reason I named him Sparky. He was. And it, we, we started going to some of the competitions and he became one of the top jumpers in the country for about three years in a row. And I thought, you know, instead of going all over the country and doing it, I'll buy my own pool in the dock and I'll start putting on competitions. And I named it Ultimate Air Dogs. And right now we do about 55 shows or competitions a year all over the country. And that's what I do. I travel the country, hang out with people that love their dogs and have a great time. And if people want more thing. information, the website, Mill? It's www.ultimateairdogs.com or .net. You can go to either one of those and get info on there, and we have our schedule. We're going to be in – actually, we're going to be in Cincinnati this weekend. How so cool. we're going down Isn't to Cincinnati, my old 
stomping grounds. And actually, when I, I posted on a message board, somebody asked me if I could come in and pitch two innings for the Reds this weekend. <laughs> hey, they're no, always you might complete the game. You better yeah, watch it. Better watch it. <laughs> but we just had, had a picture of Milton and his uh, air dogs on the uh, screen, though. But Milt, uh, it's been a it's a bit of pleasure, it, it, and we really wish has. you continue uh, good luck in the uh, air dog endeavors. And uh, you had a terrific career, and it was great talking some baseball. We'll stay in touch and. Uh, and thanks for giving us uh, some time on this Monday evening. Thanks so much, Mike. All right, guys, anytime, give me a call and go Tigers. Go Tigers. Thanks, <laughs> Mill.